Welcome to episode 192 of 10 Minute Record Reviews. This time I'm going to talk about Bob Marley and the Whalers' debut for Island Records in 1973, Catch a Fire. What I have here is uh, an Italian reissue of uncertain date and provenance. In terms of what to expect, this is a crackling international debut. It's very much the big time. It's their first record for Island Records. They've had some previous singles released somewhat illegitimately in the UK, as we'll find out. But this is the first time they were distributed widely across the Western Hemisphere. The title, Catch a Fire, apparently means burn in hell. And this is quite a political album. It's also quite a romantic album in points. The only thing which is missing from the big trifecta is a lot of spirituality, which is surprising because Bunny, Bob, and Peter were all now thoroughly immersed in Rastafari, but somehow or other doesn't really make it onto the record. The story of the Whalers is reasonably well known. Bunny Whaler, Bob Marley, and Peter Tosh had met in the early 1960s through their common music teacher, a guy called Joe Higgs. As they developed in this period, they had a little bit of success playing ska. Bob then goes off for a while to spend some time in the United States with his mother, who was living there. While he's gone, Bunny and Peter convert to Rastafari. Bob comes back and he converts too. And then they get hooked up in the mid-late 60s, I think 1967, with Johnny Nash, who, of course, most of us would know from the song, I Can See Clearly Now the Rain Is Gone. They start writing for him. They also get signed by his manager, a guy called Danny Sims, and they become, for a while, a CBS Records act. During this period of a few years, the Whalers are caught up in what is the rapid evolution of Jamaican pop music from the very fast beat of ska, boom cha boom cha boom cha, in the early 1960s, to the more mid-tempo and very heavily R&B influenced sound of rock steady, 66, 67, 68, thereabouts, to eventually the development of the slower, more bass heavy, more politically and spiritually conscious sound of reggae. Reggae, and particularly Roots Reggae, which of course is that stripped down, very politically and socially focused version of the music, would go on to dominate the 1970s. And the Whalers are right there at its birth, particularly through their work with Lee Scratch Perry, the famous producer. Perry, who in literal terms has nothing to do with this record, actually has an awful lot to do with how it comes about. In the early 60s, he'd been a real rounder in the local Jamaican scene. He'd eventually gotten a job at Studio One, the famous recording studio with Cox and Dodd. And little by little, he learned the art of producing, and he also began to produce his own records and began to perform in those records. Lee Perry's career, of course, is a story which basically includes equal parts success and equal parts falling out with other well-known people in the music industry. And in 1966, he falls out with Dodd in Studio One, and he goes to work for Joe Gibbs, who's running a rival studio in Kingston. The studio that Gibbs is running at this point is called Amalgamated Records. So Perry goes to work for him, and then one of the very first things he does is produce basically a diss track aimed at Cox and Dodd, who is a pretty giant figure in the Jamaican music scene. So this takes some cojones. He then goes on to produce a string of hits, including the famous song Long Shot by the Pioneers, which is widely considered to be the very first song out of Jamaica with a truly reggae beat. No one studio run by anybody else in Kingston was ever going to be big enough to contain Lee Perry. And sure enough, in 1968, he falls out with Gibbs as well. So he leaves him, starts his own label in his own studio, calls himself The Upsetter, creates a band called The Upsetters, and one of the very first things he does is then kick out a diss track aimed at Joe Gibbs, the guy who had taken him on after he'd fallen out with Cox and Dodd. The Upsetters, who became his house band, released a whole string of largely instrumental tracks in 68, 69, 70, which were big hits, but also really helped to define the sound that we now easily associate as reggae. And to form this band, he tried to find the best musicians that were available in Kingston who were willing to be part of the scene. And that included the members of a group called the Hippie Boys, and they included the bassist, Aston Family Man Barrett, and the drummer, Carlton Barrett, two brothers. Perry's reputation was increasing. This reggae sound was very attractive to the cutting edge of Jamaican music, and so, of course, he had attracted the attention of the Whalers, who were beginning to work with Perry quite frequently in the latter part of the 1960s. Whalers, of course, were largely a three-piece singing group, and so with Perry and his house band, The Upsetters, they cut a whole bunch of the very best tracks the Whalers ever produced in that decade. Unfortunately, while this collaboration was yielding incredible music, it was not destined to last for a couple of reasons. First of all, Perry, who was very jealous, began to notice that the Barrett brothers were really glomming on to Bunny, Peter, and Bob. The bigger deal was that all the Jamaica-only singles, which Perry had been producing for the Whalers, he was then shipping over to the UK, and Perry himself was taking the profits from that, and the Whalers had no idea. Until 1970, when they found out. Apparently there was violence. Bunny Whaler claims to have beaten Perry up. He also claims that Perry brought a bottle of acid, as in not LSD, but as in sulfuric acid or something like that, to a meeting. Perry denies this. Who knows if it's true? But 
they had a huge falling out over these revenues and over Perry's behavior. So they still had this relationship with Johnny Nash. In the latter part of 71, Nash is touring the UK. The rest of the Whalers band comes over, along with the Barrett brothers, who had now formally defected from Lee Perry and were part of the Whalers themselves, who were now a five-piece unit, and they toured the UK in support of Nash. The tour ends in the early winter of 1972, and the Whalers have not banked a lot of cash from the tour. They don't have enough money actually to buy themselves tickets to get back to Jamaica. So they reach out to their road manager, to the only other person basically they knew in Britain who was Chris Blackwell. And they asked him if he could front them some money. He agrees to do this. Not only does he do that, he signs them. He fronts them the money to go back to Jamaica and he also gives them enough of an advance to record an album, which ends up being this record. This album was recorded in Kingston between May and October 1972. It's got seven songs written by Bob Marley and two written by Peter Tosh. It's recorded at three separate studios in Kingston, Dynamic Sound, Harry J's, and Randy's, and it's produced by both Chris Blackwell and Bob Marley, though not together in the booth kind of sequentially as things panned out. Despite the fairly minimal liner notes, there are lots of session players on here. Rabbit Bundrick played on every song in the record on keyboards, synthesizer, and clavinet. The not yet famous but soon to be famous Robbie Shakespeare is on bass but only on one song, Concrete Jungle. Tyrone Downey, the organist who would later join Bob when he was on his own after Bunny and Peter had left, plays on Stir It Up and Concrete Jungle. On percussion, Chris Karen, Francisco Willie Pep, and Winston Wright all chipped in. The famous I3 female backup singers had not yet fully formed, but two of them are present here. Rita Marley, who's Bob's wife, and her friend, Marsha Griffiths. Marsha Griffiths at the time was quite a big star, a singing star in Jamaica. Final session player in all this. It's a guy called Wayne Perkins, who was part of the famous Muscle Shoals backing band. He was asked by Blackwell to come into Island Studios in London and add some guitar overdubs for the song Slave Driver. He had no idea what reggae was, but anyway, he ends up playing guitar not just on Slave Driver, but on Concrete Jungle, on Baby We've Got a Date, and probably most famously, the Wah Wah lead on Stir It Up, which is such a distinctive part of that song. So that one starts with Concrete Jungle, well-known, very good song, which begins with a intro which is really quite unusual for a reggae song probably because it's played by somebody who never actually heard a reggae record in his life but somehow it all seems to work the next song slave driver is effectively the title track because the album's title is woven very heavily into the lyrics all about turning the tables in the white oppressor and very much consistent with jamaican themes around this time time of disillusionment there's been so much optimism with independence in 1962 eight years later black people are still in poverty white people are still living high off the hog and things just aren't adding up I mentioned there aren't too many spiritual tracks in the record. The exception is maybe 400 Years, which is the next song written by Tosh. Tosh redid this later on. That version is much grittier. The production is much less lush. Peter's other song in the record follows, which is Stop That Train. Now, this is a political song. It's kind of a despairing song about the enduring poverty and hunger of black Jamaicans. It's also probably the strongest melody to this point on the record. The final track on side one is very much a change of pace. It's a lover's tune, Baby We've Got a Date, written by Bob. Side 2 starts with a track which was to become a Bob Marty classic, Stir It Up. Is it about making love? Probably. Is it about smoking herb? Maybe. Kinky Reggae follows another great track of all the really satisfying chunka chunka kind of visceral reggae tracks. This may be the most viscerally satisfying. No More Trouble is pretty much straight down the middle, standard Marley fare. Make love, not war. Help the weak if you're strong. The final track, Midnight Ravers, is one of the strangest tracks in the whole Bob Marley slash Whalers catalog. Its lyrics are kind of ambiguous, but largely they seem to be a warning about spiritual death in society, resulting in large measure from gender confusion. This album is a real leap forward for the Whalers. It's got four to five really great tracks. It's also a huge step forward in production. It's lush, it's full, there are far more layers to the music. It also led to their becoming international stars crossing over, which of course basically means that white people learned about them and liked their music. Does this make them less legit? Well, possibly, particularly if you're kind of fond of that lo-fi 60s, genuinely Jamaican sound. On the other hand, if Chris Blackwell had not come along and if their paths hadn't crossed, you know, would we be talking about them today? Would they have made the splash internationally? that they did. Well, I guess those questions are unanswerable and kind of moot. Some say this is the best ever Marley LP of any variety. I'm not sure that's the case, but as the very first step the Whalers took towards global fame, I think for that reason alone, it's kind of an essential part of any collection. And of course, it's one of only two releases on Island with the original lineup. For me, it's four and a half out of five stars.